Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. It's 12.30, it's Thursday. And I am here with JP Mason. It's PJ Dykes and JP Mason. How are you doing, JP? Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, good to be here back in the studio. It's always good to have you in the studio. Um, it's a different experience when it's face-to-face, -face, JP, rather than the dialing, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't need to worry about what Celtic top I'm going to hang or <laughs> football top uh, behind me. And uh, yeah, it's just, I don't know, just feels a bit more relaxed and natural. First thing I want to bring up is, um, obviously, over the last 18 months almost, uh, the Axon Bulletin has been going out on a, a daily basis on the weekdays, and we always go out one day at the weekend. And we get all the incredible messages, JP, from people who said that this was their anchor. Um, I get called a lot of things that rhyme with that <laughs> as well from people, but this was their anchor during the lockdown. It was great for their mental health. And I think it's it's only right that today of all days we we actually put that out there because I was incensed by um, a, a tweet that I saw there just the other day talking about how Scottish football doesn't benefit your mental health and some of the the comments that came in through through that fact I, I was astonished and saddened to 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 see that people don't realise how important football is to to um, communities of people you know in society. Aye, I mean. I, I I really was astonished as well. I, I I skimmed through a few of them and then just started to get really angry because it's it's you know if you if you were to dismiss anything that helps someone's mental health, um, just because it's something that you don't have any interest in or don't like or think is beneath you or something like that, you know, it just it staggers me. You know, if if you were to slag anybody or say somebody was like really into Lego and that helped their mental health, what are you going to slag off Lego and have a go at that? You know, it just um, it just seems it's a really, really strange attitude to have when everything is so delicate at the moment and as again in these times where, you know, again, we're, we're shut out of games um, and um, you're starting to get shut off away from other people, encouraged not to see other people. So what, what do you have? What do you have to fall back on? You have your passions. And if one of your passions is football, then you're going to indulge in things like, you know, uh, going to the games if you can, and also things that replace that, which are, you know, people talking about football like us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. See, the big thing about going to the game, though, and I always think that there's a certain level of society that's always looked down their nose at football culture and football fans um, as a support base, as a as a section of society, which is completely wrong. And that, you know, that goes right into the political aspect of how I can go to Murrayfield and watch a rugby game and have a beer, and I can't do that in, in a football stadium at the same time. Um, you know, with the same capacity, let's say, of 50,000, 60,000 people. I can't do that in Scotland. So I think there's an issue there anyway. But in terms of the mental health, JP, it's not just that 90 minutes of football. I mean, people's whole days um, are centred around getting to the game, be that as part of a CSC or through in a motor with your mates or your brother or your old man or whatever it might be, whatever your kind of routine is. And then it's the aftermath of that as well. So, and, and also... A lot of people spend time with their family. I mean, I, I think back, we did a thing just last week there with a the Celtic collection video, retrospective. And what I loved about uh, looking at the, that old footage was that's me and my old man going to the games in the early 90s. You know what I mean? And it was a proper father and son bonding day because I never saw him all week because he was at his work and I was at school, etc. So to turn around and say that football is not important to people's well-being mentally, I find absurd and I think it's... It's just inherently wrong. But I want to pinpoint the fact that also, if whatever happens, Axon will be coming out at 12.30 every weekday, no matter what. I mean, we had a, a thing in here in Dal Keith a few weeks back, JP, where and I don't even know if it was mentioned on the bulletin, but it was on a Friday, right? And it was just the, the world stopped because uh, there was no signal. There was no Wi-Fi. The world stopped in Dal Keith. <laughs> Instantly, people are jumping in their car and fleeing Dal Keith because they couldn't get online. They couldn't check their phone. It was quite scary <laughs> to see people's reaction. I couldn't get out of Dal Keith. I was stuck, right? So I'm phoning around uh, the Axon contributor saying, right, who's got working Wi-Fi? And uh, let's get this set up. And we were able to put it out. Um, but it was almost as if you were caught, it cut adrift, almost like an isolation. Yeah. And a lot of people are feeling like that during the fear of another lockdown, the fear of not seeing their friends and their communities or even their workmates because... I've been in jobs where you can moan and moan and moan about your work, JP, but there's, you know, there's a societal issue uh, if you're not going into a workplace, if, if you're in a, in a 
in a room in your house, 100%. logging in, all that kind of stuff, and you're not actually getting that day-to-day -day interaction with other like-minded human beings. And hopefully, we have that interaction with like-minded Celtic supporters. So I think it's really important. I'm not overstating Axon's part in this. I'm just saying that football is important for people's mental health, and we shouldn't accept anybody who tells us otherwise, JP. I mean, over the piece, you've been going to watch Celtic for how many years? 25, 30 years? 88 was my first game. So, I mean, regular, wow. regularly since uh, 96, 97, would, I would say, would be as in consecutive games and going to away games and all the rest of it. So, yeah, but that that long, that that's a that's a huge commitment. And as, as Ange Postacoglu said, this is a generational thing. People have dedicated their lives to this and their children's lives. And obviously you'll get people that, that, that you know, turn their nose up at that and go, it's ridiculous. Why would you spend, you know, so much time? But it's it's a passion, it's an interest. Uh, it's and not it, a choice. Uh, it is, it's isn't, a choice. isn't a choice. Once you're in, you're in. It's, it's, it's not something you can just drop out of. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm really glad that I'm in and uh, able to experience the highs and lows of, of being a Celtic fan and, and all that it encompasses, you know, things like this. And, you know, like you say, the match day, post-match, after, you know, post-match, pre-match, rituals, all of that, and all the other things that it takes you, you know, to places you've not been to before in, in Europe and, you know, experience different cultures and see how people react to Celtic fans en masse in the middle of Munich, for example. <laughs> um, you know, w when would you ever have experienced that if you weren't a football fan, do you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I know you like traveling, you travel through your work, a fair bit and hopefully that will continue in 2022 but there's always that thing where you see a set of hoops jp and you know that there's a like-minded individual there no matter where you are in the world you can go and speak to them you can have a drink with them and there's you know you, you share a state of mind don't you aye, aye. um i always think back to uh my first game is 87 i'm not trying to get one up up and shit when it was the same season but i went no no it was the season before you were centenary season i was 88 and it was one of the first home games of 88 89 so right. yeah and the thing with 89 was we're still wearing the centenary kit right so you've got the memories of the previous season which was like fairy tale as billy mcneil called it at the time you've got largely the same group of players i know that mark leaves during the 88 89 season um, but in terms of the spirit and, and the performances and all of these things, it was a completely different season. Mm. Um, and obviously, you know, the last game of the season, the Scottish Cup final, um, you know, we stopped Rangers winning a treble. We beat them one nothing that, that day. And that was a massive turnaround from the previous season where we've won the league in fairy tale fashion. Um, and I think the biggest issue, I was talking to Wee Joe Miller about this a few years ago, and it was basically what went wrong, Joe, you know? And he recalls it was either near the end of the, the centenary season or the beginning of the following season. And he's he's at Seamill Hydro. So it's probably one of the big cup games at the end of the season. And he's going for a walk, which was uh, one of the traditions that I don't know if footballers still go for a walk with their teammates these days. But <laughs> Joe and Billy McNeil goes for a walk and they're talking about Billy's plans for the following season and the players that he wanted to bring in. And he actually believed that he might do something in Europe. Now, bearing in mind... Billy McNeil, um, as a manager, had taken us to the quarterfinal of the European Cup in 1980 against Real Madrid. So he had ambitions to do something in Europe. We go into the pre-season. This isn't part of the agenda, by the way. We're just chewing the fat here. <laughs> we go into that pre-season, and the board allow to sign two players. They're both goalkeepers. One of them's Alan Ruff and one of them's Ian Andrews. So even back then, it shows the real lack of ambition that Celtic had in the boardroom at that stage, didn't it? And obviously. We had a really poor season had it not been for the Scottish Cup win against Rangers in the last day. Well, it was the beginning of it was the beginning of the the dark times, wasn't it? You know, like that that led into obviously eight eighty nine, and then you got eighty nine ninety, and then from then on, it's just you know a good few years of you know acknowledging the fact that we were nowhere near you know where we should be and. The level of player that came in was was a uh, <laughs> it was uh, a bit erratic. Mm. Um, you know, for for every John Collins, there was a you know uh, I'm trying to think of John Hewitt. I or you know I was think I always you always go for Stuart Slater as a as a kind of go to guy to sort of pinpoint, but um, there was so many others as well. I mean, I mean, I liked Pat McGinley, but was Pat McGinley a great Celtic player? No. Um, 
it's things like that. So you know, you, you remember all these players, and then that's why when you, the good times come along, you appreciate the good times way more if you've uh, <laughs> if you've lived through those 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 days when you're finishing third and fourth in the league and not getting anywhere near cup finals. Mm -hmm. You know, never mind getting to them. Um, so yeah. I always have the joke with Declan and Amy um, because they're a lot younger than myself. And uh, up until last season, the worst they'd ever seen was that time we conceded a corner kick. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I think Amy's still, I think Amy maybe needs some sort of therapy to get through. <laughs> uh, the, well, last season must have been a real shock to the system for her because you know, I, I listened to her talk. She was just like, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how to compute this in my head that we're not you know, winning a treble or, you yeah. know, winning the league or whatever. And it does make you think, my, my friend's son, he's, I think he's like maybe nine, eight or nine. And he's always experienced the Celtic winning all throughout that time. You know, never experienced that low of last season. Um, and he never really experienced it in person either because he goes to the games with his dad, but mm -hmm. obviously never got to see anything because we weren't there, um, which is... Uh, you know, everyone has their own thoughts on that, but I mean, I I just hated not being there. Whether it was winning, losing, or drawing, and just not being at the games was horrible. As it was the other day again with St Johnston, I had a ticket, couldn't mm -hmm. go. <laughs> no, absolutely. And again, going back to that community aspect of it, JP. You know, I always think back to Lawrence Cornice coming in to say Super Joe, talking about wee Joe there. Somebody else is saying that. You know, I'm just casually name dropping. Name -dropping <laughs> Friend of the stars. It does happen for time to time, <laughs> and, and I apologise in advance. Um, but you do, that's only because uh, I've bugged all these people for an interview at some point in my life, JP, and they've uh, given in and given me an interview. Um, and then, obviously, I've got them all somewhere on a laptop or on a dictaphone and you know, it's always good to to dig into these old chats that you've had. I mean, these guys first. are approachable. It's not as if yeah. we're talking about Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi or something like that. You know, it's and no disrespect to Joe Miller, by the way, great player for Celtic, but you know, as if as if he's not going to want to talk about, you know, his time at Celtic. You know, I mean, it's the best time of his life. Oh, it was. And you know, Joe's dad played. Um, he played with Hamilton in Swindon Town. His name was also Joe, and mm. he had a wee fruit shop in Glasgow and it was in Sword Street and it's now the penalty spot. So oh, there's right. another wee name drop for nice. uh, Kevin Tate doing at the penalty spot. Pay him a visit. Loads of great Celtic memorabilia. Um, yeah, so when I was doing that video last week, and by the way, uh, there was a period of time, probably over a six-month period, JP, where I had a, a box of old Celtic VHS tapes from back in the day when I used to get them at Christmas and birthdays and all that kind of stuff like everybody else. But I realised I didn't have them all. So I went online to see if I could find a comprehensive list. Where do you find that kind of thing? Normally it's a Celtic wiki, right? So I go into the wiki and there, there, there is a list, but there was some additions missing, etc. So I think I managed to put a list together of every Celtic VHS, and I think there's 60, right? So we've done one, which was last week, the collection, volume one. Um, next week, when Kelvin, the, vis the video expert, stroke specialist, aficionado, um, freak of nature when it comes to videography, <laughs> comes back in, we'll get on to number two, and we're going to work our way through the entire collection of 60 Celtic videos. Uh, we started off in probably the worst times in 1991, <laughs> but looking back on that, though, as I said, it brings back a lot of bizarre memories for me because, you know, Tony Cascarino gets bought for $1.1 million. And I'm not just saying this with hindsight, but at the time, I remember having a conversation that we should be buying somebody like Bernie Slavin, who wanted to sign for Celtic. We could have got him for 750 grand. It would have been a different type of player, Celtic daft, all that kind of stuff. I didn't I didn't actually think we needed a striker at the time, but if you're going to spend a million quid on Cascarino, why not get Slavin? You mentioned Slater. I would have signed Pat Nevin instead mm. of Stuart Slater. I think you'd have got more out of Pat Nevin at that time. Is that a possibility? Well, he, in his recent book, he's written a, an autobiography, part one of an autobiography. Um, there's a couple of occasions where Celtic could have signed him. And one of them was when he went to Tranmere. Mm -hmm. So he went to Tranmere from Everton. And it was at that stage, early 90s, that's when we could have got him. We had talks with Paul McGrath. We could have had Paul McGrath in, but we bought Gary Gillespie. We bought Tony Mowbray. You know, so we're spending a lot of money but we weren't actually getting um, the quality that we required at that time. 
And the only thing that came good at Cascarino was the fact that we swapped him for Tommy Boyd um, in the end. Hindsight is a great thing. You're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> but anyone who went to the games at the time watching Cascarino, they didn't they didn't need hind hindsight to know that he just wasn't up to the job. I remember that Hearts game, right? So it's 10 games into his Celtic career. Comes on as a sub. Tommy Coyne lays him on. Henry Smith's beaten. He's got an open goal to score, and he? he hits it with his heel. He almost misses, right? But that's his first goal in a Celtic jersey. Five, six minutes later, he hooks Craig Levine and gets sent off. That was Tony Cascarino's introduction <laughs> as a Celtic goal scorer. I'm sure quite a few people would like to do that. Uh, well, perhaps. <laughs> um, Axon documentary featuring all videos was really good. We're going to do every individual video, and I was telling JP about some of the other ideas that we've got going into 2022 short documentary style uh, content on the YouTube channel. So if you haven't done so already, get yourself onto the YouTube channel, subscribe, free charge, hit the notifications bell. We are going to talk about the here and now, JP. Uh, we're, you know, a quarter of the way into the show and we're still in 1991. <laughs> the the headline on today's uh, bulletin is actually, how did and resurrect Celtic careers of Tommy Rogic, Tony Ralston, and Mir Beaton. And there's loads of other things to discuss, but this is one of the, the talking points that had you and I at any point last season spoken about any of these three guys, you might have been a wee bit sad to see the back of Tom Rogic because he gave us some great memories, but they seem to be on the periphery of the Celtic squad. JP had they left in the summer, it would have been mm. hey-ho. You know, uh, a lot of Celtic players leave every summer and it would have been one of their ones. Uh, let's go through them individually, starting with Tommy Rogic. Maybe the obvious one, because they had worked together with Australia and a few people had said, Tommy Rogic, you know, we're going to see a, a different side to Tommy Rogic because Ange Postacoglu knew, knows the player. Um, I think he's he's kind of moving into the territory of having his finest season in a Celtic jersey. Aye, ah, no doubt, absolutely no doubt. And if you saw the, um, unfortunately, obviously, like many of us watching the game on, on TV. I was actually at my uncle's in Aberdeen watching it on my phone with one uh, one earpiece, earphone in. My uncle can't stand football, isn't bothered about it. I actually moved to Aberdeen to get away from the Central Belt uh, Rangers Celtic thing um, in the 70s. I think he moved, late 70s, he moved up there. So he's been there ever since. Uh, doesn't care about football. So I'm sort of sitting watching the game on the fly. But one thing I did notice that at the end of the game, when Rogic came off, him and Postacoglu exchanged a kind of wee nod. Like, I don't know if you saw that. Rogic just gave him a kind of... There was no big hugs, you know, like Furuhashi style in the cup final. There was just a kind of nod from Rogic to Postacoglu as if to say, job done. I've, you know, I, I, I've done I've done my job for you today type thing. And and Postacoglu just went like that. They had a wee, a wee high five. And, you know, that that is, that is the thing. He did do his job. He, he, he did. He's doing his job and winning games for Celtic, playing really well, you know, putting himself forward to be man in the match in many, many games, which, mm -hmm. you know, and contributing in a way that he hasn't previously. And I think I've spoken about this before when um, we've, we've been talking about players and their contributions in the last, you know, however many seasons. Obviously, Rogic has been here for about nine seasons, eight, nine seasons. I was looking at that. This is his ninth season. Yeah, that's quite wild to think that. Mm -hmm. But his contributions in those times have been sporadic. Obviously, at times, you know, absolutely monumental. You know, like the the, the goals goals against um, Rangers Cup finals. Um, never really been that great in Europe, if, if I'm honest. I don't really think Tom Rogic. Can you really remember any huge Tom Rogic games in Europe in the past? Probably that's not. A good point. Um, but. At this season, it's it's consistency. It's playing far um, more minutes in a game than he's ever done before. Um, playing with a strength, holding off players, really looking like someone that just doesn't want to get beat in that team. And you know, the more people like that you've got in your team, the better. And obviously, he's blessed with unbelievable touch, mm -hmm. skill, can finish so well, and it, he's he's really staking a claim to be one of the guys that should we be fortunate enough to get our hands on the trophy that we all want to get our hands on again. The roar that would greet Tom Rogic lifting that trophy, if that was to happen, would be something else because, 
you know, he's he's lifted it before. And you know when players get it gets down the pecking order to players and they lift the trophy and the cheers at the start are huge for the first players. And then as they get down, it's kind of like, way, way, you know, and it just comes like, oh, right. <laughs> he was one of the way players. Yeah, right. It wasn't, it wasn't one of the, you Standing know, proper, like absolutely. everyone going absolutely mental. Um, and, and, and Rogic, you know, I think maybe... Maybe I don't know the guy. Don't really know much about him. He doesn't give much away. There's very few interviews with Tom Rogic. Apparently, doesn't like speaking to the media. I've heard that. Well, it's obvious because we don't really know. I, I I don't know much about Tom Rogic. I can't tell you what he is like as a guy or anything like that. So, um, but maybe I'm just guessing. Maybe he's kind of thinking, look, my career's coming not to an end. I mean, let's not. He's he's only what twenty nine, twenty. 829. I mean, he's got a few years left, but maybe he's kind of thinking, look, I've not got long of this left. I was nearly at the door to Qatar, where I would have been playing in like a football and backwater, you know. Same retirement. Yeah. I mean, I, I I want to make this count and and he's doing it. When you consider the fact he's been with Celtic for nine seasons, mm. uh, I remember not that long ago when Scott Brown got his testimonial. And I think I probably asked the question on the podcast when it was an audio pod back then. Is this the last of a dying breed? Are we ever going to see this again? Mm. Because I, I remember going back to the 90s and the 80s, there was quite regular testimonial games. And mm-hmm. I mean, if you think of the 1980s, Danny McGrain, Roy Aiken, uh, Tommy Burns, my first game, testimonial games, David Proven got a testimonial. Um, not many of the Lions got testimonials, inter- interestingly enough, especially when you see the longevity of a lot of their careers. Um, and then you move into the likes of Peter Grant, Pat Bonner, Paul McStay. There was always a clutch, you know, through the decades. Mm-hmm. But it was getting less and less. Um, I don't think the benefit game for Larson can be called a testimonial because it was a seven-year thing. Um, but then you had, like, Jackie. Jackie mm-hmm. Mack got his testimonial. Mm-hmm. Um, Sunday, Tom Boyd. Tom Tommy Boyd, Boyd yeah. I remember that as well. Man I United. remember that game. Um, somebody come in on the comments, if I'm wrong here, I think... Between Jackie and Scott Brown, there were no testimonials. Quite so that possible. was quite a lengthy period of time. Probably the longest period of time, JP, since the first testimonial game mm. that Celtic gave for one of their long-serving players. And now we're in that scenario when we've got Jamesy Forrest, Callum McGregor, who are guaranteed testimonial games, mm. and then just behind them, Tom Rogic and Nir Beaton. Mm. He's in his eighth season, moving into his ninth year next season. And I never thought I'd see that. In, in this modern day that would have four players who within the next three or four years potentially could have testimonials. Mm. JP, now, how has that happened? Is that is that just a cycle? Is it because there was a, a period of time, perhaps under Ben and Rogers, I would suggest, where um, it looked as though we did have a, a more long-term plan? You know, because previous to that, it was like almost just like season to season, win the league, win the league, especially through the nine in a row era it became you just wanted to get that next one on the board towards 10. Um, the longevity, where did that come in? Do you think a lot of that can be uh, credit can be given to Brendan Rodgers to give them the kind of vision that, that they might stay at the club longer? I think Rodgers and, and Beaton, uh, there's a there's an element of luck there. Yeah, I mean, I think James Forrest has touched on this, that he's spoken to players who have left Celtic and realised that the grass isn't always greener. On the other side, you know that it's not as if you're going to go and play um, at a club uh, like Celtic anywhere else. Really, there's not there's not really comparisons, you know, to to go and play in England. You're not going to play like you play at Celtic with that intensity and and European football and everything else. And you know, it may or may not be because they like living in Glasgow. I, I think near Beaton. As from as far as I know, is quite happy in Glasgow, and you know, has got family here and everything else. So maybe he's just sort of thinking in those terms. Mm. Um, but you know, I, I wouldn't want to be as cynical as to say that they are playing towards a testimonial. I think the testimonial. But we we spoke about this, and I said maybe in the summer we were talking about how absurd it was that your Beaton was approaching the testimonial at Celtic, and I was thinking. The guy's only played however many games it is for Celtic. He's never really contributed. You know that you you could never really hang your hat on a, a trophy, be it a league title or a, a, a cup competition, and say that was near Beaton played such a huge part in that. You know he didn't he didn't in the league in league runs 
you know, beat on for me they didn't ever really have this kind of impact on a on a on the team in, in a season that would make you go like you say when the league trophy's been lifted at the end of the season near beat on would just be like a huh. You know, it, 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 I mean, no disrespect to the guy, that's but even, that's even lesser than the last. Year I know, I know, but I mean, it's true though. I mean, we we we've watched the team over this this period of time. We've seen who's contributed and who's not. And I did say at the time, you know, if if near Beaton was to contribute something, then maybe the idea of a testimonial wouldn't be as absurd. You know, if near Beaton plays a part, which he has done this season, yes, he's not been man of the match every week or anything like that. But he's definitely um, helping the team out and putting in performances that are getting us results when we really, really need them. You know, like uh, the other week there, obviously St. Johnston and, um, you know, he's come in and played in midfield, which is his natural position and looked far more assured. And nobody, I don't think anybody ever really questioned whether or not he was a decent enough midfielder. Mm. Um, I think we could all just question his judgment and his temperament as we saw against Mitchell and, um, you know, where that was just completely unnecessary in a game of such high stakes yeah. to do something as rash as that, you know, that certainly made me at that time go, well, I'm, I'm you know, fully off um, uh, this sort of near beat on idea of him being a, a first team player. But, you know, he's he's come in, he's done the job. And like you say, Ange Postacoglu is getting a tune out of him that maybe previous managers haven't. And, you know, it, we're all we're just speculating as to as to Postacoglu's man management, but we're we're seeing we're seeing the results of it and the fruits of it in front of our eyes. You know, we've seen him working with players that we've seen not contribute, and now they are, and he's he's the difference. So therefore, you attribute it to Ange Postacoglu. Yeah, we do. We, we do give a lot of credit. I mean, so many points you made there. Um, eight seasons near beaton has been at Celtic. This is his eighth campaign. Two hundred and fifty games. And I think that speaks, and a lot of them are substitute appearances yeah, yeah. for LJP. So I think that speaks volumes. You're talking about the the cheers that go down the line when you've won a trophy, and you've got the rapturous applause followed by the the one that you said earlier about Tommy Roger, yeah. And then you've got that one there. It was a wee bit mm, like mm-hmm. that, right? But then you've got the the ironic cheer that the likes of Marvin Colfer <laughs> used to get Aye. when he went off for his medal, um, where everybody cheers because it's big Marvin. Um, but another thing about uh, near Beaton is I. I've got to go back to that Michelin game and I probably made similar comments last season after the Rangers game when I got sent off mm. where I would have happily not seen him playing in a Celtic jersey again. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd need to re-watch the post-match after the Michelin game, but I was raging when he beat on that day. Oh, yeah. Absolutely raging with him. And I just thought, no, that's it. You know, you've not done enough in a Celtic jersey. This is the last straw. I was annoyed at you last season. Game over for you. Mm-hmm. And then the last game there against St. Johnston, he runs out as a captain. <laughs> and nobody could argue that. Mm-hmm. And he puts in a, one of the best performances he's put in in a Celtic jersey. Scores a goal. Um, it was a proper leader's performance. Mm-hmm. So I've said this before. We get it wrong at times, or do we? I mean, was I wrong to criticise him? Probably went over the top, to the, the criticism of him at that time, JP. Um, but, I mean, he's proved us wrong. And I'm sitting here today saying that the biggest turnaround for me, on a personal level, would probably be beat on because I always rated Rogic, mm-hmm. you know, I, I knew what he could do. Yeah, and um, Tony Ralston, I just didn't think he had the run of games that uh, any player needs to prove or disprove their, their ability, and that does move us on to to Tony Ralston. Um, absolute, you know, a candidate, a candidate for player of the season. Yeah, certainly for Celtic. Maybe people would argue and say, "Oh, he's not got a chance of player of the season overall in the league," but you know, certainly for Celtic's player of the season, uh, you know, and that's wild to think that you'd be saying that when you've got the likes of Kyogo Furashi and Jota <laughs> in the mix as well. Um but it's 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 a it's a reality. It's a it's a reality and it's the world we are living in that, that Tony Ralston has completely and utterly shoved every bit of criticism that we've leveled at him back at us. See the big thing we opened up the show talking about mental health and I always go back to this with Tony Ralston. JP, right? So, yes, they're footballers, but it doesn't make them invincible in terms of their mental wellness. Things do affect them. They're human beings, JP. And I've heard stories about footballers who have had to come off social media after no wonder. specific Jeez, uh, incidents. You know, they've yeah. had to come off because of the criticism. Ryan Christie did it. Christie got sent off against Livia away mm-hmm. 
and it was just this outpouring of frustration and, and people being targeted. Now, Tony Ralston was the whipping boy, even when he wasn't playing. Mm. He was always spoken about as some kind of joke character that would never kick a ball for Celtic. Uh, until we've got like 13 players down after the, the Dubai debacle, right? And then he comes in, played pretty well, and he's back out again. Mm. And this is a guy who had come in 17 years of age, similarly to, to Kieran Tierney, who was 17. He comes into the team, um, performed well enough for Rodgers to give him a bumper deal, which just ran out in the, the pre-season pass there. Um, there was that famous or infamous picture of him in Neymar, where he's laughing at him. Um, and and I, di I didn't think that aged that well, but Tony has had the last laugh, hasn't he? Well, certainly, and anybody that doubted him, um, I, the reason I doubted him was just because you think when players go out on loan to, you know, a St Johnston or, or Dundee United and get, you know, a run of games, I don't even really know. I need I'd need to study and see what he did at that time in those games and those in those and at those clubs and to see how often he played. But you never really got these reports back that he was, um, you know, this sort of standout player for them. And you expect, you know, whether it's being big headed or not, but you expect a Celtic player, you know, to go to a a, a club in our division and perform, you know, uh, uh, perform well anyway. Certainly to perform at a level that is uh, befitting of the fact that they're a Celtic player. You know, yeah. I mean, you look at Lee Griffiths scoring that free kick at the weekend. You know, I. I if Lee Griffiths is as good as he says he is, <laughs> I would be expecting Lee Griffiths to be pinging things like that in every week. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been, you know. So I think that was his second goal. Ah, it was only his second goal. I mean, it was an absolute raker of a free kick. There's no doubt about that. But you know, when when I when a Celtic player, and I know Lee Griffiths is a bit of different circumstance. You know, he's not a young player going out to get experience. He's a guy who we gave a contract to, and then clearly, you know, um, probably shouldn't have. Um, but but Ralston going out. You know, like McGregor going to Notts County, or you know, um, Ayer going to Kilmarnock, or you know, all those guys went out and played at a level, and obviously came back with maybe not gold stars, but certainly silver stars. Um, and Ralston came back and gave us no knowledge or no uh, encouragement that he was going to be a guy that was going to solve our problems at right back. Mm -hmm. He came back and it was just going to be like, oh well, he's just another guy that's on the books that might get a game every now and then and probably his contract will run down and probably will leave. And nobody, including me, would have been bothered if Ralston had left in the summer. Um, but I, 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 whatever has happened with that guy, whether it's him personally, whether it's, you know, um, Postacoglu, I have no idea. Maybe it's, a, it's a, a combination of all those things have come together to allow him to perform at a level that none of us really thought. He could because he's just you know he he just he's going to give you everything in every game now and it's almost like he's because he's done it once he knows he can do it and therefore he can get back he can get to that level every in every game because he because he knows that he can be a man in the match player and it's 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 so great to see because he's obviously Scottish we we've we've brought him through the ranks and you know I'd happily see eleven players of the same of the same milk. Uh, and You've always I, said that. Aye, I, I, I mean, a hundred percent. You know, we've we've spent so much money on guys that don't care about the jersey, don't care about the club. You know, happy to get a paycheck and and then and then check out and leave. And we've made them rich, rich guys. Yeah, <laughs> and then, absolutely. And then, like and then, that's that we've basically set them up for life, and they've not given us anything back. You know, I mean, everybody moans about the amount of money players get. You know, and Yes, it is a bit insane how much they get paid, but if a player comes in and does well for Celtic and gives us the memories and the success that we, um, it's all relative, isn't it? You know, it's, it's you know about how much money the club makes as a result of that player and the success and everything else. Like, I mean, I don't think anybody could begrudge Henrik Larsson having you know a healthy bank account as a result of being at Celtic. You know. Because he that benefit game, and he also released two VHS videos, which will all be featuring <laughs> in, the, in the series. The Magnificent Seven was that one of them? And one of them was tongue in cheek. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a ton. Tongue oh, that's that. No, it's not a Magnificent Seven. The tongue in cheek one is one. Uh -huh. I, I had that. I don't know where it's gone, but I had that. Yeah, it was good. We will be covering that. Jake. Good. Um, some great points coming through, Brown Warrior. Uh, thanks for getting involved. Celtic have always been the biggest draw for testimonials due to the big gates. Yes, and I remember reading about that JP in the Not the View which was my Bible in the 1980s and the 90s, 
and there was quite a few lined up at the time. So we were lined up to to play Paul Davis uh, testimonial down at Arsenal. Uh, we had Neville Southall, Everton, Ian Rush, Liverpool, Brian Robson, Manchester United, all within the space of a few years. And we were also meant to be going back to Everton to play Graham Sharp's testimonial. Oh, yeah. And it didn't happen. And I remember there being a wee article in the Not The View talking about how there are certain players who just want Celtic for the crowd because I think Graham Sharp was a Rangers fan. So mm. he's obviously realising that we would take X amount of thousand down to the game. So they was actually just like uh, using us for the gate. Yeah, you know? I was at Jimmy Phillips' testimonial against yeah. Bolton Wonders. Yeah. Um Jimmy Phillips, I think, was that right? Was that his name? He was he was ex. I'm pretty sure he was ex Rangers as well. And we agreed to play Bolton Wonders at Reebok Stadium, and uh, we filled their way in. But that I was at that with my dad. Yeah. Um, Marty, did we not play Marty in his testimony? Oh, I didn't know that. Aye, aye. Yeah, sure we did. But we were the biggest draw. You're absolutely right. Bring Warrior, and then they started using us as a result of that. Um, Tony Mowbray, remember his testimony mm-hmm. in Middlesbrough as well. Um, I wasn't at that particular game, but I heard that the mood around about that wasn't great. Uh, Brian, Mur- there was a bit of hassle at the, at the stadium that day. Mm-hmm. Brian Murphy, Jackie Mack got a testimonial and then went to Wolves. There were no testimonials for a long time after that. Mm-hmm. I, I think, Brian, the next one from a Celtic player's perspective was Scott Brown. Somebody could correct me if I'm wrong. Finn Fogel, testimonials were held to give players a big payday due to them not having great wages through their careers. Players make so much money now. Absolutely. And I think it was Niall Quinn, though, the first guy, though, that came out and said that. He got a testimonial. He says, listen, I've made good money through my career. And he gave all the money to charity. Mm. And I think he was the first one to do that. We also went down and played uh, Mark Hughes' testimonial. Um, Dare he be mentioned? <laughs> I'll always mention it. I'll always mention Sparky. That's another one. Loved him for Man United, yeah. Oh, he was brilliant. He was absolutely superb. See, see if you can hear um, Peter Grant's chat about his testimonial. There's an interview somewhere. I can't remember if it's, uh, you know, on, on video or if it's just, if, if I've just read it, but he he did not expect an attendance that night. Like, was it was at Bayern Munich we played. Yeah, it was Peter, I? Peter, Peter. Klinsmann and Matthias. Yeah. He, Over can. Yeah, he didn't expect an attendance that night. And I think somebody came into the dressing room, might have been Tommy Burns, and said, uh, you should see the cues out there. And Peter Grant, I think, thought he'd just said that to make him feel better because I think he thought there was only going to be like a paltry crowd or whatever. And he said he was just overcome with emotion when he went out and saw how many people had turned out for, for him. And I, I don't know the, I don't know what the exact attendance was. I'm pretty sure it, it was wasn't. Forty plus. Yeah, it was. Think. It was not a sellout, and but it wasn't uh, the full. No. You know, Celtic Park at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that was the the temporary stand days. I probably wrong. No, it probably uh, was. I was at the game. I remember being at the game, and the wee guy ran on the park to get Clinsman's autograph. Oh yeah. Hi. <laughs> Who was that? Are you watching? <laughs> um, reveal yourself, uh, David O'Leary testimonial. Arsenal versus Celtic. Pierce O'Leary played. Mm-hmm. That's right. There's some great pictures from that from that game as well. And yeah, they did seem to be a thing in the past. Pedro Mack comes in, Gary Kelly at Leeds. There was more Celtic fans in Leeds at Elland Road. Um, it seemed to be a thing in the past, but then lo and behold, we've got a few players in the works for a testimonial. Now, I'm going to ask you a question about each of the players that we've spoken about so far, JP. Tony Ralston, is he our first choice right back or is Zhiranovic? I've seen a lot of chat around that question over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really seen, or we haven't really seen Iranovic play a consistent number of games now in a row as as right back. It's been quite erratic. I mean, God, was it the cup final where he played nearly? Every, <laughs> he played like right back, left back, and then uh, like right wing. Yeah. Right wing. Yeah. So he's he's kind of been just willing to sort of put his hand up and play anywhere, which is an admirable. Uh, uh, sort of thing to do, but you know, it, it's not he's not been at right back, you know, for a run of four or five games. So I, I don't really know if if I could say that Juranovic should get that nod ahead of Ralston when Ralston's played so well and played consistently well um, as as right back. I mean, there's there'll be still people in comments on this that will be like, "Nat Ralston's not good enough," you know, and that's that is a really a uh, hard line to take on the Tony Ralston situation if you're actually going to be that committed to your uh, principles that you, you can't see past, you know, just because he's not fashionable or because he's... Even Colin Watt 
has come round oh, to, really? to well, the go. fact that Ralston is a player. Oh yeah, I I, I was listening to um to Laura and uh, Colin's podcast in my uh, hotel room last night in uh, in in uh, in Edinburgh. And uh, I, that's because Axon put you up in hotels before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean. oh yeah, <laughs> I, I, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I was DJing a wedding, uh, <laughs> and it was very enjoyable too. But uh, I, I was listening to the podcast. I only got to, I, I only got to the defence and the ratings of the defence before I, I, I fell asleep. So the last, the last I heard before my my eyes shut was uh, Starfelt and Carter Vickers. But I did hear Colin Watt. I think give Tony Ralston an A. If he was rating, it was either an A or an A plus, which you know is high praise from Colin. So, ah, absolutely. I'm just having a look at the the comment section. Uh, we are in here on our own today, so I'm having to do the old blocking. So I'm not going to apologise if you're blocked. It's for good reason. Um, and there was a couple of other wee points came in here. Someone said, I need to dig it out. Someone actually said Celtic podcasts a good thing or a bad thing. Right now. You might say, oh, you would say that, Paul, but I'm going to say they're a very good thing. And the reason for that goes right back to the opening salvo of this particular show. Now, Axon is no longer a podcast. Podcast is what we started off as, audio. You could get it on your iTunes and all the different audio players and all that kind of stuff, JP. And then we decided to, to build it into something a wee bit different. And lo and behold, you get live streams, but you also get fully produced content. We mini documentaries are coming your way. Um, a Celtic State of Mind has the YouTube channel. That's where we put all our content. And it's all free. Is there a good thing or a bad thing? Well, all I'm going to say to that is there's a lot of negativity flying around uh, society at the best of times anyway, JP. But you see a lot of it on social media. And I don't, I'm not talking about podcasts, just in general. A lot of negativity kicking about. And so if you do a Celtic podcast, you get criticised. But I'll tell you, all the contacts that we get from people who like what we do outweigh anybody who just throwing mud at you, you know? And we had a good chat about that this morning, didn't we, JP? Mm -hmm. People who actually contact you uh, directly, send you emails, and even Christmas cards. I showed you a Christmas card <laughs> that we got from one of our listeners. Absolutely uh, astonishing. People send us stuff that we can raffle off for the charity that we're raising uh, funds for St. Mary's. The link's underneath the video. So... Yeah, you might think I'm biased, but I'm going to say Celtic podcasts, and I don't just mean that some Celtic podcasts, good thing. What's your thoughts, Kev? Uh, Kev? JP, what's your thoughts? <laughs> Wait, We've got a few Kevs in let me team. just produce my uh, book of poetry <laughs> and I will uh, I'll give you my answer. Um, available from axum.net, oh. by the way. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, see if you're just to take it from the point of view as being a contributor to this, <laughs> to, be, to be part of this and to have... Uh, contributed over the last 18 months longer now. Well, no, actually, it's, it's been a year for me. It's been a year. When was your first appearance? Maybe you came like, to it was, Well, I mean, I was on, you know, as a guest and interviewed by yourself and Kevin in, in August 2018. Mm -hmm. So, and then nothing after that. We just, you know, um, remained in touch and whatnot. But I think the, the first time I was on was December last year. So I think it was after... A St Johnston game, the maybe the one one the game, game maybe. the one one game yeah. at home, right. um, and and obviously at that point I'm sitting in my flat, can't see anybody, you know, watching the game on the past the paradise, um, and you know just to get involved in it, you know, at that time was immense for me as a, as something to help me out at that time and have a, a purpose and have something to look forward to, you know, whether it was the bulletin or getting involved in the, in the, in the, the post and uh, pre-match uh, bulletins uh, around the games, because I wasn't going to the games, wasn't doing my usual thing. So mm -hmm. just to be able to sit and talk to people about the games and yes, it might be broadcast, but um, you know, it was either, it was either that or you would just sit on the phone and talk to talk to your mates which you didn't really do. So like if it's structured and it's, you know, put together like this, then it is a bit more kind of organized and yeah, it really, really helped me. But then the, the, the sort of kickback to that is people getting in touch and, you know, meeting people, <laughs> meeting people in the street recently, uh, who've, 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 you know, given comment and, and, and said thanks. And, you know, it seems bizarre to be thanked for sitting, talking about Celtic, you know, 
just something that you love doing and mm. uh, and and yeah i mean obviously like you say there is negativity flying about but I, I i'm the same as you i tend to sort of park that and just focus on the on the, on the good things that people have said you've got to the big thing about the negativity is a lot of it is absolute nonsense yeah. you know just because somebody says something online doesn't make it true no. and that's the big thing jp but i'm not about to give airtime to anybody who throws that kind of mud at axon but what i would say is you reintroduced me to to something fairly recently mm -hmm. and there was a great uh section of that which i sent you during the week there if, if you've never seen the defiant ones with dr dre and jimmy iovine it's on netflix isn't it yeah uh, four part series, absolutely superb. Goes right into the roots of both the guys' careers, how they came together, and how they eventually sold Beats to Apple for something like 3.2 billion quid. And they were talking to Ivan about how humans should act like racehorses get the blinkers on because the minute you look at what anybody else is doing, you end up falling over. And that for me is what Axon does because I know there's loads of great Celtic. Um, content makers out there there's great podcasts we come together once a year jp you know there's absolutely no drama we had i think 14 podcasts this year on the charity weekender a few more last year mm -hmm. and there is no pod wars it's not east coast west coast rap kind of <laughs> levels here um, and they're doing so much great work but i simply don't have the time to, to watch Everything else, there's so much of them out there. I, don't... I, barely, I barely have time to watch hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was catching up in my bed last night of the bulletin yesterday just because I always like to, you know, keep on top of everything. But like, I haven't watched or listened to the rest of yesterday's bulletin yet because so how the hell would I have time to watch rival clubs <laughs> content? I mean, I that... don't get that. Ah, that's I mean, mental. No, I'm saying that there's a couple of people that come in regularly, like Paul Cockwell, who's a Hibs fan. Yeah. With a Dundee United fans in the, the chat. Great. Love it. Let's have a chat about it. Um, you know, just previously on the Scream of Celtic show, Johnny Proctor, Dundee United fan, was on. And he was going on about Ralston. And he gave us a wee insight into his performances at Dundee United. Right. Apparently played pretty well for Dundee okay. United. Um, but I never heard it at the time. I mm. never heard that from St. Johnson fans. And certainly never heard anything about his time at Queen's Park. So mm -hmm. um, I think it's good to engage. That's the biggest thing. And there's a community of people online. And we've got to remember that it's not just a wee bubble. I mean, we get comments from people all over the world since Ange and Kyogo came, came into Celtic. Uh, you can see the heat map on, on our analytics that more people are tuning in from Australia, more people are tuning in from Japan. And that blows my mind when you're, you're going out there and people in Vatican City are watching Axom. I love all that kind of stuff. Um, but that does take me on to the, the Japan subject and new players coming in. It seems to be ramping up a few uh, notches, JP. We have heard all about Daizen Maeda, um, Ryo Hatati, and Yosuke Aideguchi. And I'm sure my pronunciations of all the three players will get better as time goes on. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited about bringing them in. I think that there will be um, a springboard there also for Kyogo to have some of his countrymen there with him. And mm. it's bound to help. You know, yeah. it's bound to help. But and I'm not being negative here. My concern is we need more. We need more than that. Yeah, it, it, it does seem like those are the only three names that we've heard and we've not heard anything else. We're, but we know that there's likely to be outgoings, you would have thought, given the lack of game time for the likes of Bongoli, Ayeti. I know Barkas played at the weekend. Again, negativity directed towards Barkas and this sort of almost he's, he's become this sort of lampooned comedic figure you know he's not played enough games to warrant that you know I, 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 it's not as if he played the whole of last season he, I think he played maybe what 15 to 20 games last season or something like that and playing behind a defence that was calamitous at best yeah you know and ever changing and ever changing there was very really a settled back four um, you know and then people were quick to say oh well he was at fault for the the Kane goal against St. Johnson. I'm like, really? Was he? It was a really good ball. And the defence lost him in uh, in mid-flight and he connected well with it. You know, I very much doubt Joe Hart would have got, got to that. Um, or many keepers, really. So I, I think there was a really... There's been a targeted campaign against Barkas, which I think is, is preposterous, really. I mean, um, I don't think he's a terrible keeper. He's just not had the best of fortune at Celtic. And, and you know... 
arrived at a time, one of the worst times possible to arrive at the club, you know, which, which, which happens sometimes, you know, like players come at the wrong time and then come good, you know, maybe a year or two later. Um, and, pay, and sometimes players arrive and start really well and then disappear into obscurity after, you know, I mean, I think a Yeti started pretty well. Everybody thought, well, this guy looks all right. He can score a goal he or did. two. Yeah. Um, and now he's, you know, you know, he's kind of, now he's, he's become a bit of a joke figure as well. Um, but yeah, these guys coming in, uh, Maeda, it's interesting that it's a loan with an option to buy. Why that is, I don't know. Maybe they're just sort of um, concerned that he might not hit the ground running as well as Kyogo Furuhashi has. Uh I, I really don't know. It's just, it's a bit of a strange one, but ultimately, he looks he looks like a really strong player, and we we need reinforcements up top, as we've seen having to play a badder through the middle. Obviously, he did okay against St. Johnson, but it's not something I would like to see us rely on for the second half of the season, and um, which is obviously where my aid is coming in. But I certainly think we still need um, a centre half and probably another midfielder as well like a proper midfielder and um, someone that would you know pick up a jersey and, and keep a hold of it mm. well that takes me back to to beat on mm. we've, we've spoken about ralston and his kind of place in the team Roderick's a first pick we know that Where, where's beat on in the pecking order i mean he's he's definitely pushed himself into contention for that slot in midfield to, to play uh, regularly um, but I, I just don't know if you could hang your hat on him to be that guy he's never been the best with injuries he's, you know, he picks them up quite often yeah. um, you know and you, I, I just I really I, nobody really knows what's happening with McCarthy I thought McCarthy played okay um, the other day um, but again there's question marks over him Um I just think that we we definitely need another another midfielder in there because um, Turnbull's now out. Apparently, Turnbull's out for two months. I don't know how much truth there is to that, mm. but if Turnbull is going to be out for two months, then you worry that that two months could become three, and then that's you deep into the business end of the season. So um, maybe that would have changed people's thinking um in the in the recruitment department whatever that is or whoever that is at Celtic um to look at to look at a midfielder um now that that, that Turnbull could potentially be out because I don't know what position uh, Edigucci plays really like I don't really know what his uh what what is he ranked is he 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 plays central midfield or attacking midfield okay well in that case that might that might yeah. be a, 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 an answer to our problems. I think Hata, Hatate is a, a left back or left wing back, or centre midfield. Or what I was midfield. impressed with, with these three players is their adaptability. JP, yeah. they're not just buying somebody who can play one role. They, they've all got that adaptability. So Hatate can can fill in at left back and left wing. A bit like Liam Scales, uh, but he can also play central midfield. Well, Postecoglou knows these guys pretty well I would say far better than any of us uh, so the thing you don't want is at the end of the window Ange Postacoglu to not be happy with mm. what he's got in if he's happy with those three guys and thinks that we can run with that until the end of the season then fine but if he's looking for more and, and doesn't get more because of poor planning or um, the right person the wrong person being in the recruitment department or whatever or whether it's Michael Nicholson or whoever um, you just you don't want you don't want that kind of uh, that kind of upset because he should be given all the tools that he can, especially after the absolute nightmare that was the summer transfer window where he was, you know, didn't know if it was New Year or New York. So um, that that that's that's Show Tuesday or Sheffield Wednesday. Hi, <laughs> that's got to be amended for for this transfer window. And I know January is a difficult window to get players in, and there's the, the you know that it's, it's that's kind of a, the, the the fable and the myth about January transfer windows. But maybe for once we may actually do it right. I hope so because I think January and I think Ollie Burke. Now Ollie Burke, we I are. think <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Team over here. Yeah. I think Ollie Burke potentially is a Scottish footballer with the highest amount of accumulative transfer fees in the history of football. Mm. I think he is. And if there's somebody out there who's got more, give us a shout. I know that there was players like Stephen Fletcher who had loads 
obviously Tierney with a twenty-five million pound move. Um, uh, the other one was maybe quite surprising. Jordan Rhodes, I think, has got quite a oh, high yeah. mm-hmm. um, accumulative transfer fee. But Ollie Burke, straight out of Kirkcaldy, um, has got one of the highest, but it just didn't happen for him at Celtic. But mm. I think he played pretty well at Tynecastle <coughs> on one occasion. Red yeah. Scotland comes in. Jim Orr is dynamite. I agree with that. But I think Donnie meant another Jim, Jim Simonetti, a good friend of us. Jim Sinetti was instrumental in setting the studio up and he used to come on on a regular basis. Um, but is concentrating elsewhere his work. But yes, a very good guy and a big, big friend of a Celtic state of mind. Um, yes, thanks everybody for getting involved in the chat. Donny Boy sixty seven comes in to say that uh, it's a big part of the the life kind of experience getting involved in the chat. Um, and someone else uh, runs with that kind of suggestion as well and says it's good when people are disagreeing. What I would say on a disagreement stakes is that. I think there's a lot of different views in amongst the 14 or so contributors that we've got, JP, but it very really turns into an argumentative um, discussion. Mm. Uh, you can disagree with it, kind of descending into an argument or kind of shock jock uh, tactics. But, I mean, I disagree with a lot of things. So that, do I. I hear things all the time. <laughs> and then I go, what? I mean, I'm not going to name names, uh, probably because I can't say examples, but I've definitely heard <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> people on the bullet and say things and I kind of like shake my head, go, nah, don't agree with that, you know. Um, or, you know, people making judgments about players too soon um, as, as, as one thing that I've I've been, you know, mindful of. Um, but, you know, it's all healthy. So it's, it's everybody's course, everybody's a Celtic fan. I keep sending out the agenda, but nobody reads it. Um, you know, the, the agenda, according to Paul John Dykes, JP, but yeah. nobody reads it and they just have their own freedom of thought, which yeah. I think is a disgrace. So <laughs> um, my, one... my inbox is empty on that front. I've never... <laughs> <laughs> You've never been told what to say. No. Um, music. We love oh. music, JP. You love it. And, um, you know, we speak about it from time to time. It's at that moment of the show where we're just about on 57 minutes. Are we allowed to talk about music for a couple of minutes? I mean, well, what do you think? We, 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 may be, <laughs> we may be attacked from all angles by certain certain uh, watchers. Music and Celtic goes hand in hand. It, go, it always has them. The community aspect of singing uh, goes hand in hand with the Irish diaspora coming over, the community aspect of going to the football you sing on the bus on the way through, you sing at the game, that primal scream element of working all week just to be able to scream and shout and sing on a Saturday as it was back in the day. Music and football goes hand in hand, as does Celtic fans within the music industry. You see a lot of these bands and artists that I love, uh, and I love them even more when they reveal their uh, affection for Celtic. But what I'm going to have to ask you, JP, you... At this stage of this, the year, won't be back on Axon until 2022. And I need to ask you, your top three LPs, these might even be recommendations if mm-hmm. someone out there hasn't actually heard them, of the last 12 months. 2021, top three, as chosen by JP Mason and why? Well, this is not something that I've given extensive thought to. And uh, I used to... Um, when I was writing for um, the Is This Music, Stuart would always ask us at the end of the year to send our top 10 and all the contributors would all be asked for their top 10s and he would he would you know create a point system and then create a, a, an Is This Music top 10 or top 20 from all the contributors. And I used to sit down and pour over it for hours because I was like, I can't just sort of flippantly send him 10 albums and, and then I'd send them and then I'd be like, oh no, I've forgotten so-and-so's album or this album and and i would be annoyed with myself so um this is definitely a very quick one two three be no surprise that mogwai as love continues is is in there um yes i know them yes i've been a fan of them for a long long time but i, I genuinely think this record is uh is up there with with the best that they've they've done um uh richie uh richie sacramento that track is is amazing. Ceiling Granny, amazing. Ceiling Granny, which is a which is from a scene in Exorcist Three. Um, somebody asked Barry where that track came from, and I and, know the scene. Ah, uh, yeah, Ceiling Granny. So that's from that. Richie Sacramento is what they uh, use as a slang term for the composer Ryushi Sakamoto. They're like, oh, Richie Sacramento. Eh? And so that, that that's that. And and just yeah, I I, I suppose like the time it came out, it came out in lockdown. I listened to it um, start to finish on 
uh, Twitter listening party with Tim Burgess. So it was, you know, getting insight like the ceiling granny patter uh, about each track and, you know, really felt um, kind of consumed by the record. And uh, I've listened to it a lot since. So um, Mogwai, mainly instrumental uh, Scottish post-rock band from uh, Motherwell and surrounding areas. Uh, second would be Arab Strap, um, As Days Get Dark, first album, first studio album by Arab Strap since I think 2006, um, was always going to be something that you were kind of like, oh, hope this is good because it's it's Arab Strap and it's, it's Aidan Moffat, it's Malcolm Middle and it's two guys that I, you know, have got to know as well over the last few years working in the in the the world of music, and you, you, when when somebody like that of that sort of stature is releasing a record, you're always kind of hopeful that it's going to be up to up to uh, you know the standard, and it more than delivered. Um, absolutely phenomenal record, and uh, listened to that a lot as well, and uh, was fortunate to see them live, albeit stripped back in uh, Paisley as part of the Paisley Spree. They played in the in the Spiegel tent. Um, I missed the Barrowland shows because I was working a show that night. Um, so I missed them at the Barrowland, which would have been great. And the third is uh, an American artist called Cassandra Jenkins, who probably people haven't heard of, but she's got an album called uh, An Overview on Phenomenal Nature. And my friend Nathan, who um, runs the Bridenell Social Club in Leeds, which is a tremendous venue, um, he recommended that album to me. I think he mentioned it in a phone call. And then chased me up in it and said, have you listened to it yet? And then I listened to it and uh, aye, it's it's really great. She's an American artist from Brooklyn um, and I'm not entirely sure what she's done before that record. I'm pretty sure she's done something because she's 37 years old. So, um, But this record, for whatever reason, has really kind of um, got her a bit of traction and I would recommend that. So there you go. Three. Well, you know, I'm going to download all three of them, uh, JP. Well, to them as uh, I've obviously got my, my way, yeah. so what I'm going to say is if JP says it's good music wise I'm in I'm in honourable mention as well too this is this, this was my almost in the top three but Olivia Rodrigo's album Sour I bet you well Lawrence Conley messaged me and it was just like, the day that the tickets went and sale was just like JP my daughter's wanting a ticket for this uh, <laughs> Olivia Rodrigo lassie and I was like oh you too I no wonder there's like thousands of people tried to get tickets for that gig at the academy next year and uh, uh, they sold out very very quickly so I told Lawrence I'd see what I could do but pff, who knows but I mean uh, it's it's Obviously, it's pop music, and she's going to be probably as big as the likes of Dua Lipa and uh, Taylor Swift and things like that. But she's she's really really good, and the album's great. Um, so there you go. I love your recommendations. You know that you tell me on what's on, and I'll do it. Uh, going back to the Celtic music uh, crossover, Brian Murphy comes in again. Ah, lads, if you're going to discuss music, can we chat about Thin Lizzy? Now they were a top band. Yeah, we can. And you might have heard the story before. But a lot of people ask me, having written the book, where did the term the Quality Street Gang came, come from? Right. So Phil Linnett's mum, Philomena, had a pub in Manchester. And in that pub drank a gang of guys who were an organised crime group um, who didn't have a nickname, but who started dressing like the characters out of the adverts uh, for Macintosh's Quality Street because they were all dressed like Bugsy Malone characters. And they started coming into the pub and somebody shouted over, who do they guys think they are, the Quality Street Gang? So that was a real gang in Manchester, and Phil Linnett of Thin Lizzy wrote a song about them called The Boys Are Back in Town. Now, they used to play a wee bounce game on a Sunday, and the manager of the team was Paddy Crerant, and he used to bring over George Best, who I don't know what stage of his career he was at, but he used to play, and they would have a bevy and all the rest of it. So Paddy Crerant became aware of the terminology, the Qualic Street Gang. He comes up to Glasgow to meet Jock Steen, Jock Steen introduces them to a few of the, the up-and-coming players uh, and they walked in, all dressed, suited and booted, David Cat and that, Kenny Dalbush, etc. And Paddy Creran said, who do they think they are? The Quality Street Gang. That's where the name come from. So there's the seamless um, transition from music to self. Also, last night at the wedding that I was DJing at, uh, it was the singer from We Were Promised Jetpacks and Lackey, uh, the drummer in the Jetpacks, his dad was coming up and drunkenly hassling me to play uh, various different bands. You know that guy 
or girl that's always at a wedding that hassles the DJ for songs and knows best and knows the crowd and you know this is what this will get everybody going and uh, so he came up and uh, demanded Thin Lizzy last night demanded Thin Lizzy I played the boys are back in town genuinely and uh, he all, I, I, no I said to him who's your favourite band and he said the Jetpacks. And I went, well, okay, that's because your son's in the band. That makes sense. But, you know, what? Who, who else? And he went, Black Dog Days. And I was like, who are Black Dog Days? I looked him up. Shock, his other son is in Black Dog Days, band from uh, West Lothian. And I'm right, right, forget them. Right? Who's your favourite? Who's, 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 the band? who's the bands that you went to see? Like, who did you go and see live? And he was just like, well, I saw Queen, I saw Thin Lizzy, I saw Bad Company, uh, George Michael, and I was like, right, now you're talking. And I was like, here we go. So I just lined up, played Queen, I want to break free, and then played Boys Are Back in Town. And he was in the, this was during the buffet, by the way. So he's in the middle of the dance floor, spinning round, it. giving it yeeha in the middle of the dance floor. Did he have a kilt on? He did have a kilt on, of course he did. I've seen some footage. <laughs> uh, somebody just randomly comes in and says, Stanley Road, yes, Chancellor, I'll have that all day long. But if I'm going to give you... Not left field Weller album, there's so many Weller albums. One that you might not have bought into at the time, as is now. Give that a listen retrospectively. What an album that is, by the way. Broken Stones. Absolutely superb, as is now. Give it a listen. Um, we like a bit of football, a bit of music and a bit of culture on Axon, so uh, keep it coming. Brian, again, you've you've been um, on the chat all day. Brian, Phil Linnett was a Man U fan. Um, there you go. I think there's a great picture of him with Georgie Best, in actual fact, who also drank at his mum's pub. <laughs> Phil and Mina won it. We could talk all day about football and music, JP. It's been a topsy-turvy year in, in more ways than one. Uh, but big plans for 2022. Uh, the question was asked, Celtic podcast, a good thing or a bad thing? We're going to say it's a good thing and we're going to keep creating content and keep it free for everybody who enjoys it. It's been an absolute pleasure all year to be talking to contributors like JP Mason and others, and uh, you all know who you are. On a Monday, it's myself with Amy Canavan and Tony Haggerty. On a Tuesday, we've got Paddy McGilp, Declan McConville, Lawrence Conley. On a Wednesday, it's Brian Degnan and Colin Watt, Kevin Graham. On a Thursday, it's just you and me. The only day of the week when there's only two. And then on a Friday, we have the aforementioned Jim Orwell, Laura Bradburn, Tony Haggerty, and guest appearances from Jarrett Hill, who comes in from Australia, and Alan Morrison. There are others, like Kevin McCluskey and David Slight, who chip in as well. Uh, not to forget we Kevin Tate, who's always in about the chat. So, yeah, it's a big team. It's a, a quality, loyal team. And we are going to be adding to it in the new year. So watch this space. Thanks everybody for getting involved. And thank you once again to JP Mason for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind.